This episode is exclusively sponsored by the Chime In Podcast. When Mike and I aren't listening to our own show, we love to chime in to some of our favorite hosts in the true crime unexplained genre. We're talking about the Chime In Podcast. Graham, Sarah, and Michaela explore topics including the unexplained, true crime, missing persons, and much more. Their show has included distinguished guests such as U.S. Marshals, Darren Sharper of Cooper Vortex, and Chris Williamson of Vanished and Chasing Earhart. But wait, there's more. To make it more fun, each episode includes trivia questions that involve the audience. Mike and I have been enjoying the Chime In podcast since 2018, and now we want to share it with you. You can download and subscribe to the Chime In podcast wherever you listen to your shows. Find them on Twitter at Chime In Podcast, also Instagram at chimein.pod, and Facebook as Chime In Podcast. That's C-H-I-M-E-I-N Podcast. They're big supporters of Locations Unknown, and we hope that our friends enjoy their show as much as we do. Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to an episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who can speak Braille and Spanish, Mike <laughs> Van de Bogart. Uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to all the loyal listeners for tuning in. Just a couple of quick updates. First, we actually have no new Patreon shout-outs for this episode. It makes Joe... Joe and I are incredibly sad, so... I don't have... Oh, wait, do I have a... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, if, you, if you do like the show and you want to you wanna help the show out, we, uh, we have a Patreon page, where as, for as little as $5, you can get a lot of extra episodes. We're up to 28. And, and to hear your name on yeah, the podcast. Hear your name on the podcast. That's worth it by itself. And we release these episodes early. This one is probably not going to get posted for a couple of days, so you'd get that early on... Patreon. We also have YouTube memberships, pretty much a similar thing. And we have premium subscriptions on Apple now. So it's live. You'll you can find a link to that in the show notes here. Um, finally, if you uh you hate us, love us, uh you have a few too many drinks and you're listening and you want to call the show and talk to us via voicemail, you can call 208-391-6913. The funniest voicemails will make it onto the show at some point. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, they make it onto the Patreon episodes. Yeah, and so. if I mean, if they're really outlandish and funny, they might even make it onto a normal episode. Yeah. Um. So just call that number. And finally, with uh, Veterans Day coming up, Joe and I obviously just want to thank all of the men and women who've served the country that are here in the U.S. and out around the world on duty. And uh, this episode, kind of, it's about the case. The guy in this case was a distinguished veteran of the Vietnam War. And I thought it was just a great time of the year to talk about this case with Veterans Day coming up. Probably when you listen to this, it will already have passed, but uh, we're recording right now a few days before Veterans Day to kind of give you a little inside baseball there. <laughs> so uh, other than that, Joe, do you have any other updates? No, nope, that, that's it. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. September 19th, 2021, a Vietnam vet, Navy SEAL, park ranger, and author was with his brother on a four-night excursion in the Shoshono Lake area of Yellowstone National Park. 
When the two failed to check in with their families, the search began. What could cause such an experienced outdoorsman to go missing? Join us this week as we investigate the disappearance of Kim Crumbo. Yellowstone National Park. Have we done one I, in Yellowstone? We have not done a Yellowstone. I was I was gonna I was Park. trying to think. I'm like, I don't think we have. No. We've done a, I think Grand Tetons. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have done that one. Yeah. So anyone who is not familiar with Wyoming, Yellowstone is just north of Grand Tetons. So if you've hiked Yellow uh, Grand Tetons, um it's not the same. Yellowstone, I've I've driven through it. I've hiked the Tetons. I've never hiked in Yellowstone, but I've driven through it. It's looks similar in a lot of ways, but um, it's definitely on my list. Yep. <laughs> Add it <laughs> all, to the they're, list. they're all on the list. And I think, can you look I up? Said, I said Shoshono, didn't I? I think it's Shoshone. It's Shoshone. I, I yeah, added a little, a little flair at the end. Yeah. you just uh, in a <laughs> Just fancy, a piece of flair. Fancy mood today. Yeah. <laughs> so the location is the Shoshone Lake area. Uh, just some facts about Yellowstone. It is 2.2 million Square we, acres, I acres, uh, <laughs> similar to the quick. similar to the size of Puerto Rico. Uh, Yellowstone was the first national park in the U.S. and is also widely held to be uh, one of the first national parks in the world. I think uh, we are the first ones to come up with national parks, so that would make sense. That is acres, acres. Okay, the park is known for its wildlife and many geothermal features, especially the Old Faithful Geyser, one of its most popular. Yellowstone Lake is one of the largest high elevation lakes in North America and is centered over the Yellowstone Caldera, the largest supervolcano on the continent, which when it blows, it won't <laughs> matter where you live. No. The Caldera is considered a dormant volcano. It has erupted with tremendous force several times in the last 2 million years. Yeah, what do they say? They'll take out most of uh, the mountain range in Midwest if that explodes? Yeah, it wouldn't be good. I watched a documentary on it a, <laughs> a long time ago, and uh, thankfully... They don't expect it to blow in our lifetimes or our kids or probably in, a, you know, dozens of lifetimes. Yeah. So. Or maybe, we, can we like poke some holes in there and relieve some steam <laughs> ahead of time? Nice. Yeah. Drill a couple <laughs> holes. Maybe a few more geysers to let the steam off. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, so Shoshone Lake is 8,050 acres and it has an elevation of 7,795 feet. Uh, so Lake Geneva, which is Mike's hometown, is about 5,400 acres. So I put it's that significantly in significantly bigger. Pretty much everyone listening will have no clue about Lake Geneva, but I just, I think we have a pretty big Milwaukee following. Maybe. I wanted to put some context of how, like, just for myself, how big this lake is. Because Lake Geneva, if you've ever been on it, is it's, it's big. a big lake. Big. Um, so It's yeah. like 5,400 acres. <laughs> it's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> so max depth of Shoshone is 205 feet. The water temperature never exceeds the upper 40s. Oh, it's Oish. cold. Yeah. Storms can also whip up quickly, making kayaking difficult and life-threatening. They don't allow boats or like any motorized traffic on the lake. So really, is it just, just too treacherous? I or, think it's, well, in part, there's no preserve it. There's no roads to it. You oh, can only well, get to it by foot. So that's go. probably a main reason. But, yeah, that's um, probably the main reason is no one's going <laughs> to carry it in by hand. But uh, you know, obviously, they they want to just preserve it. It's a backcountry lake. It's yeah. one of the, the biggest in the country. All right. It's also the largest <laughs> backcountry lake in the lower 48, and it's only accessible by foot. There we go. There we go. Uh, DeLacy Creek flows south from DeLacy Lakes to Shoshone Lake. Uh, the Lewis River drains Shoshone and Lewis Lakes and is a tributary of Snake River. Uh, where is it? The park resides mostly in the northwest corner of Wyoming, with small parts extending into Montana and Idaho. Shoshone Lake is in the southwest section of the park in Wyoming. For those listening, I do have it pulled up on Google Maps. Uh, it was established on March 1st in 1872 and sees roughly 3.8 million visitors per year. That uh, was... 20. Yeah, it's uh, 2021. The rankings from 2021. That uh, number is so it's ranked number 12 of yeah. all the national parks. So the human history of the park began at least 11,000 years ago when Native Americans began to hunt and fish in the region. 
During the construction of the post office in Gard Gardner, Montana, in the 1950s, an obsidian point of Clovis origin was found that dated approximately 11,000 years ago. So obsidian is a type of rock, and uh, they use those to hunt. So they were made with like little spears and stuff. Yeah. These paleo Indians of the Clovis culture used the significant amount of obsidian found in the park to make cutting tools and weapons. Arrowheads made of Yellowstone obsidian have been found as far away as the Mississippi Valley, indicating that a regular obsidian trade existed between local tribes and tribes farther east. Obsidian is such a cool rock. It's What's like it all black. Like? It's all shiny oh, it's black. It's all shiny black. Yeah. It's really I'm sure neat. I've seen it. Or it could be like. I think I've seen uh, red. The red one's a little different. There's some rock that's super like deep red yeah. and I'm colorblind. So I'm always like, is it red, black? I don't know. <laughs> so interesting facts about uh, Yellowstone. It's officially became a national park 18 years before Wyoming or Hi Idaho and 17 years before Montana were granted statehood. So this was a park before the states that it existed in. I did not know that. Were states. Yeah, that's I didn't know that. That's cool. That is cool. Uh, people tend to assume that Yellowstone got its name from the vivid yellow color seen in the Grand Canyon of Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. As it turns out, however, the park's moniker stems from the sandstone along the Yellowstone River in eastern Montana, which is actually several hundred miles downstream and northeast of the park. <laughs> so Isn't it's it a, it's adjacent to yellow things. A lot of names that of stuff that you think relate to that thing are actually from other parts. And yeah. Like, oh, well, we're going to name it Yellowstone from this river that's hundreds of miles away. Yeah. <laughs> like, just because. Just <laughs> like, they could have just lied, man. Like, yeah, yellow trees. Yeah. <laughs> uh, at Yellowstone's nightly. This is hilarious. At Yellowstone's <laughs> nightly bear shows, uh, which ran from about 1890 to World War II, visitors would come and watch black and grizzly bears eat the park's garbage. <laughs> they even built bleachers for this event. I had no idea they did stuff like that. I mean, obviously. Uh, it's terrible for the bears, and it, oh, I didn't understand that yet. Yeah, they're I like, mean, "Hey, you, come check it out." Can you imagine if they did something like that today? Just a garbage bait pile. Yeah, they just have a <laughs> landfill, and then all the bears would come and eat, and, <laughs> and then you just pull up your car and watch <laughs> bears eating garbage and take pictures. Wow, uh, bison are one of the park's biggest draws, especially when they congregate on the roads, causing bison jams. The herds in Yellowstone are special, as they've lived in the park continuously since prehistoric times. That's really cool. Uh, the park is situated over a supervolcano that is capable of a magnitude 8 eruption. This is what we talked about earlier. In fact, the supervolcano has had three massive eruption, eruptions, the first occurring some 2.1 million years ago. While the volcano remains active today, geologists are con constantly monitoring it, you know, because like they'll warn us and we won't be able to do anything. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I know that job is important, but monitoring that volcano, how important is it? Like to warn people in Australia to go underground because that's guess. that's the only thing that will matter. Right. Uh, molten rock below the Earth's crust, known as magma, <laughs> is estimated to be just three to eight miles beneath Sour Creek Dome and eight to twelve miles beneath Mallard Lake Dome. I'm assuming that is not deep. No, which it is was, why they would uh, state it that it was way. Called out. Yeah, I I'm not a, a expert in volcanoes. geologist. Yeah, but or, uh, or volcanologist. I think that is pretty shallow. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds shallow. Yes. Uh, according to U.S. Department of Interior, the park is tasked with preserving more than 10,000 hydrothermal features, including hot springs, geysers, fumaroles, mud pots, and travertine terraces. This is roughly half of the world's hydrothermal features. That's really cool, actually. Yeah. And for most of these, you're not allowed to go in. Because yeah, you can, cause, cause you'll, you'll die. You'll killed, yeah. And people do every year. Go off the path. And and your next uh, trivia actually talks about that. Okay. Yellowstone's hot springs are so hot and acidic that they can dissolve a human body in a single day. In 2016, a visitor fell into Yellowstone hot springs, and 24 hours later, his body dissolved. Yep. Leave no trace. Yeah. Or Yellowstone will do it for you. <laughs> yeah. The vibrant colors you see in the park come from trillions of microorganisms called thermophiles. These microorganisms, which love the heat and are impossible to see with the naked eye, come together to create vibrant mats of color that give uh, thermal features like hot springs and geysers that bright look. That's cool. That's where all those colors come from. Yeah, it's all like uh, bacteria. Microorganisms. Yep. Uh, there are an estimated of 1,850 archaeological sites in the park, some of which show that people began traveling through the area more than 11,000 years ago. 
Now let's talk about the climate. Yellowstone's climate is greatly influenced by altitude with lower elevations generally found in the warmer year, warmer year round. The record high temperature of 99 degrees in 2002, while the coldest temperature recorded was negative 66 degrees in 1933. Sounds like Wisconsin weather. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's going to be like 70 tomorrow and I know. then 30 four days later. Yeah. Uh, during the summer months of June to early September, daytime highs are normally in the 70 to 80 degree range, while at night uh, time the lows can go below freezing, uh, especially at higher altitudes. Summer afternoons are frequently accompanied by thunderstorms. Spring and fall temperatures range between 30 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit with nights in the teens to single digits. So it can be pretty chilly. Yeah. It's like fall here. Warm in the sun, cold at night. Yep. Winter in Yellowstone is accompanied by high temperatures usually between 0 and 20 degrees and nighttime, temp nighttime temperatures below 0 for most of winter. Precipitation in Yellowstone is highly variable and ranges from 15 inches annually near Mammoth Hot Spring to 80 inches in the southwestern section of the park. That's a huge flux. Yeah. It's a big park, but it's still pretty close and has a big flux. Uh, the precipitation of Yellowstone is greatly influenced by the moisture channel formed by the Snake River Plain to the, to the west that was in turn formed by Yellowstone itself. Snow is possible in any month of the year, but most common between November and April, with averages of 150 inches annually around Yellowstone Lake to twice that amount at higher elevations. Uh, tornado, tornadoes in Yellowstone are rare. However, on July 21st of 1987, the most powerful tornado recorded in Wyoming touched down in the Teton wilderness of Bridger Teton National Forest and hit Yellowstone National Park. That'd be pretty wild to see, actually. Can you imagine seeing a tornado in Yellowstone? It'd probably be an amazing <laughs> picture. Yeah. Like, to capture, the like, the beauty of Yellowstone with, like, a, a twister in the I'll background. I'll Google to see if yeah, anyone Yeah, see if they have, like, a did. photo. Because it was, they said, in the 87, yeah, there's a good chance they had somebody that got a picture. I mean, in July, there'd be lots of tourists. and Yeah, maybe. Uh, called the Teton Yellowstone Tornado, it was classified as an F4. Okay, so that was legit, with wind speeds estimated between 207, 260 miles per hour. The tornado left a path of destruction eh, one to two miles wide and 24 miles long and leveled 15,000 acres of mature pine forest. In June 2022, the park closed entrances and evacuated visitors after experiencing record level rainfall and flooding that caused multiple roads and bridge failures, power outages, and mudslides. I remember that on the news. I think the park still kind of messed up from that. Yeah, I could imagine. I guess it was just in June. I I thought it was longer ago. It was yeah. just earlier this year. Yeah, it's still probably messed up. <laughs> yeah. I think they closed a huge chunk of the park, that yeah. they, which they've never done before. A uh, combination of heavy rain and rapid snow melt resulted in the Yellowstone River rising to a new record height at 13.88 feet, breaking a previous record of 11.5 feet. So it was two feet higher, roughly. Set in 1918, flooding on the Lamar River reached 16.7 feet. Uh, beating a 1996 record of 12 feet. Damage from the flooding, including washed out roads and bridges and damage to infrastructure systems, including electricity, water, and wastewater systems. Yeah, I bet that's still pretty messed up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so some of the peaks in Yellowstone, the tallest uh, Eagle Peak at 11,371 feet, uh, Mount Schurz at 11,000 feet, and Abathur and Atkins Peak at 10,928 feet. And I put in here the tree line in Yellowstone is roughly between nine and 10,000 feet, just so you, if you are doing some like summits, you are going to be above oh, the tree line and exposed. Okay. <clears throat> uh, here are some of the animals. And before the show, Mike mentioned that it's kind of like all the worst animals possible. <laughs> yeah. If I mean, you're going to run into them, you have. Badgers, black bears, grizzly bears, bobcats, cougars, Canadian, uh, Canadian lynx, coyote, gray wolf, red fox, wolverines, bison, elk, bighorn sheep, moose, bald eagles, golden eagles, osprey, peregrine, falcons, bull snakes, and prairie rattlesnakes. So, and that was just, uh, you know, I listed some of the, you know, just some of the animals you're going to find. Yeah, there's, there's more animals. Hundreds but, of mammals. But those are in this some park. main ones. Yeah. <laughs> now, those are the ones that will gore you, shred you, and then when you're laying on the ground dying, bite you. Have you seen, <laughs> uh, to go off on a little tangent, the National Park Service? I think it's Yellowstone or Grand Teton. They're telling visitors to stop licking the toads. Uh, there's no. psychedelic toads in the park. And, <laughs> or they have a, they, like, if you lick them, it, 
you get like psychedelic experience. Oh, and, I think I've heard about this, but it's like a, everybody's doing it right now, and they've had they had to release a statement. <laughs> Did you see? A, I'm gonna look up Yellowstone toad licking. Let's <laughs> see. What, Oh, yeah. oh, there it is. ABC News. The National Park Service really wants people to stop. <laughs> I'm going to read this whole headline. This will be good. <laughs> the National Park Service really wants people to stop licking this toad. <laughs> they have a little black and white picture of the toad just staring at the camera. <laughs> the common message of all visitors before going to Yellowstone goes something like this. Remember, folks, this isn't Disneyland. These animals will kill you. To emphasize this point, there's science throughout America's National Parks not to touch or feed the wildlife. Now there's another commandment. Please do not lick the toads or make any tongue contact at all. <laughs> the Sonoran toad, also known as a river toad, is one of the largest toads found in North America, seven inches. Yada, yada, yada. The toxins make people sick if they touch a toad or especially somehow poison in their mouth. So why are they licking it? Uh, it, it maybe it's Oh, like, however, oh. <laughs> this toad's toxic coating also contains a powerful hallucinogenic known as, oh, it's M 5-MeO-DMT. Yeah, colloquially, colloquially, oh, I can't say that. I can never say that word. Colloquially, I, I still can't. I know how to say it, but I can't. That's a tough Everyone question. will know what you're trying to yeah, say. Yeah, known as the 5 meth, uh, methoxy. Yeah, 5 me. If you listen to Joe Rogan, you've heard of 5 MEO DMT. I'm going to put this in the language. I, colloquially. Colloquially. Yeah, 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 I can't say it. That one I will never get right. And so, I, I knew how to say it, and I still couldn't say it. it this is just funny because I was researching this episode, and this article came out a day ago about people licking this toad because it yeah. it, it gives you, it, you know, you hallucinate. <laughs> <laughs> the last, a statement from the National Park Service. Hey there, here is the riveting late-night content no one asked for, yet here we are, the National Park Service wrote in a Facebook post. As we say with most things you come across in the National Park, whether it be banana slug, unfamiliar mushroom, or large toad with glowing eyes in the dead of night, please refrain from licking. Thank you. Banana slugs. <laughs> remember, remember those from a uh, couple episodes ago? They are out in uh, like Olympic, and people were licking them. You know what's funny about this? I'm sure it's backfiring because the people who were going to do it are going to still do it. Yeah. And now they just announced that you can do this more to people, all the people that didn't know. More so then they're going to be like, oh, you can get DMT from licking this toad. Joe and I obviously don't. Oh, uh, leave no trace. Don't touch the toads. Don't this. But that's where it's, sometimes you should just kind of shut up because we didn't know about this. Now we know about this. Yeah. So it, how many thing, thousands of people didn't? The now thing you got to think about is you have no idea how this is going to react to your body. And you could be days up and have a react get paralyzed or something or get paralyzed probably you're going to die because there's, there's no way they're going to get you back to a hospital in time so just yeah take their advice and do not lick the toads yeah don't lick the toads <laughs> in yellowstone um all right back to the uh, drinking water is a safeguard against jardia other parasites and bacteria they recommend that you boil filter or chemically treat all the water uh can be polluted by human animal waste and you can get infections uh that's as I good said, another episode yeah you'll go number three until you're out of water that's good advice anytime you're hiking anywhere yeah just filter you know follow dave matthew's water. song don't drink the water <laughs> uh hypothermia is always an issue especially in an area that can be wet and cold so rain wind sleet and snow can be deadly if proper precautions are not taken or you're wearing cotton things like that or jeans jeans and cotton shirts while you're all wet is not good so you want to make sure you have rain gear uh and clothes that do uh shed the water and help keep the water away from your body uh, hats and gloves, all the things that conserve body heat. Stream crossings, as we say in multiple shows. A few of Yellowstone's rivers or streams have bridges uh, that many cannot be accessed until July or later. Even in late summer, water levels can rise quickly after rainstorms or from snow melt on high country in the warm afternoons. This water can be cold, fast, and more than thigh deep, making attempts to cross perilous. So trying to ford deep, swift water has resulted in loss of gear, injury, and death. So you want to make sure you're... Checking your itinerary, making sure you're looking at your topographical topographical maps for stream crossings. Uh, if you are going to attempt to cross, don't have your stuff attached to you. Best uh, thing you do is you stop in the ranger station and just check on local conditions. They yeah. keep track of all all of that, and they'll tell you if they're passable or not. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, thermal features. So this is unique to this part. We've never covered much. these before. Yeah, so <clears throat> no one can complain about repeats here. <laughs> Burns from thermal features are a common cause of serious injury and death in the park. 
Check at the ranger station before you go exploring. Foot travel in all thermal areas must be confined to the boardwalks or maintain trails that are marked by official signs. So if you follow the rules yes. and you listen to us and leave no trace, you should be fine. Don't approach or shortcut through geyser basins after dark when they're in the greater danger of stepping into a hot spring. For your safety and for your protection of thermal features in Yellowstone, it is illegal to swim or bathe in any water that is entirely of thermal origin. But people continue to do it every year, and sadly... That's Darwin working. At least once a year, we read a story about someone who fell into one of them, and I can't think of a more painful way to go. Well, some of them survive. They fall in for a second and get yeah. out, and they are like permanently dismember, disfigured. Yeah. From like melting, like your skin starts to melt. It's You're in boiling water. And most of these are people who, broad daylight, left the boardwalk... If you ever seen, they go to take a picture. Yeah, and they try to get too close and they slip in. Yep. Or they drop their phone in. There was an article I read of a lady who dropped her phone in and she tried to go after it. Yeah. So just stay away from them. So outside of killing yourself, you can also destroy the area. So those hot springs contain the algae, bacteria, and fungi found nowhere else in the world. So soaking or waiting in the springs can destroy those life forms. Uh, throwing objects like rocks or sticks in the theme referred to. Uh, Thermal features is prohibited since doing so can clog the vents and alter the flow and temperature of the water. So you want to leave no trace. Yes. <laughs> Just leave it alone so it can be beautiful for everyone and else to see till it explodes and kills everyone. That also means, like, yeah, don't <laughs> don't pick stuff up and throw it around either. Yeah. Like, don't throw rocks into, you know. The whole leave no trace is to, like, pretend you're not there ever. Yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You could hover, then you could even do even better, but you leave footprints. So that's why they have the trails. Yes. So uh, ticks and mosquitoes uh, from mid-March to mid-July, grassy, brushy, low elevation areas are ideal tick habitats in Yellowstone. So you want to wear repellents uh, even on your shoes and socks to keep them from climbing all over you, uh, tucking in your pant legs, things like that. Uh, you can get diseases from ticks that last a lifetime. Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease. You do not want it. It's not fun. Uh, mosquitoes are in the area, so you want to make sure you're always... Uh, keeping against them, you can wear netting and things like that. It just makes for a better time. Yeah. Uh, Yellowstone's trails may be hard to follow due to infrequent use. Uh, it's a big park. There's missing markers in places, recent fires, large meadows, mudslides. Trails are not clear, so it's strongly recommended that people carry a compass and a map and know how to use them. So we'll talk a little bit about the weather issues. So Yellowstone can experience winter-like weather any time of the year. So calm sunny mornings can abruptly turn into fierce stormy days. Gusty south and southwest winds are common in the afternoon. So rain and lightning often follow if you're hiking or boating. When storms approach, you need to get off the water. If you're on an open ridge, if you're uh, above the tree line, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, you want to get to better protection. So nighttime temperatures can drop to 30s and 40s. So if you have a rainy day followed by a cold night, that's where we can again talk about that hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, depending on the elevation, temperatures may even fall into the 20s with light freeze even in July. So summer daytime temperatures are usually in the 70s to 80s. Uh, June can be a cool and rainy. July and August tend to be drier with the afternoon thunderstorms common. So what's the difficulty here? Um, like most national parks, there's dozens of hikes ranging from very easy to extremely hard. Yellowstone has a lot to offer no matter your experience level. So according to all trails, the most popular hikes, 85 are listed as easy. 127 are listed as moderate and 55 are listed as hard. So it's kind of like make your own story. Yeah. It's, uh, it can be as easy or as difficult as you want. Uh, if, if you aren't prepared, you can do quick stuff, you know, visit the park rangers desk, car well, hike almost basically yeah, car you drive hike. to the visitor center and you, you hike around for a couple hours. Yeah. Go to places where it's like a couple feet, see some things. Don't yeah. go into the back country, stuff like that. So, a lot of, you know, older people too, you know, people like grandparent age will just drive the roads of the park because they don't want to go hiking yep. and, and you get still out and take pictures it. with the bison. Yeah. You still see a ton. So I'm going to jump right into character profile. Cause we, we talked a lot about the park. So uh, the name of this gentleman is Kim Crumbo. He went missing September 19th of 2021. He was a male age 74. Uh, his height was five foot, 10 inches. He weighed about 200 pounds. He had green, brown hair, uh, blue eyes. The clothing and gear last seen in is unknown because they were out on a four-night excursion. Um, based on what they were doing, it's in his experience level, it's safe to assume he's probably, you know, life jacket on, what you know, cold weather gear, uh, waterproof gear, stuff like that. Um, personality, everything I read about this guy, he sounds like a, a, an amazing guy. Uh, 
His family and friends described him as very charismatic, yet humble, uh, two great traits to have in a person. <laughs> uh, but they also described him as indestructible. So he, like we said, he was a Vietnam veteran. He actually been in a helicopter crash in Vietnam where the aircraft had burst into flames Jeez. and he survived it. And he also had been attacked by an elk. So um, everyone described him as just an all around. He was very passionate about protecting the wilderness. I think he would definitely agree with our, our motto of leave no trace. Um, he was a seal. He never left a trace. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so medical issues, obviously he, uh, you know, he's had these issues with the, the helicopter crash and, uh, being attacked by an elk four years prior to this disappearance he actually had both his shoulders replaced so um he obviously had some from carrying the weight of being so awesome <laughs> yeah, so uh occupation this guy has a very long and distinguished um history he was a vietnam veteran he completed two combat combat deployments he is a former u.s navy seal on seal team one he was actually awarded the presidential unit citation from president Rich richard nixon for extraordinary heroism in vietnam that's cool uh he also received a bronze star that day for personal acts of uh heroism so he is a distinguished uh veteran he actually also was a retired national park service ranger so he retired in 1999 so some of the titles he hold while held while he was in the mps was obviously a National Park Service River Ranger, Management Specialist, and Wilderness Coordinator in Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, he also worked as a park ranger in Olympic National Park. Um, if his resume wasn't amazing enough, he also was an author. So he wrote a book called A River Runner's Guide to the History of the Grand Canyon, in which he went into meticulous detail of nearly every mile of the 277-mile run from its start at Lee's Ferry to its end at Grand Canyon uh wash cliffs so that's pretty cool he also was a frequent contributor to the salt lake tribune writing letters to the editor about protecting wolves wild horses and the environment um while you know he was doing all that he also was a member of several different organizations over the years in his work to conserve and protect uh wild places wildlife habitat connections and large predators at the time of his trip to yellowstone he was already working uh as a board member uh, and the Wildlands Coordinator for uh, Conservation Nonprofit, the uh, Rewilding <laughs> Institute. <laughs> Sorry. And he was also a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Um, he was also serving as a board member for the Western Wildlife Conservancy and Wild Arizona. Um, and he was also contributing to the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, a land conservation group, <laughs> as well as uh, the Wildlife wildlife conservation groups lobos of the southwest and project coyote so he was and he could fly and see <laughs> through walls he was uh <laughs> very very passionate about preserving nature in the wilderness and the national parks which is pretty cool uh experience in the wilderness i, I probably didn't know too much no uh <laughs> it's, she's extremely experienced this guy is about as experienced as you get not like only the model american like i mean if like western frontier if i got lost and could make you know like uh who wants to be a millionaire and you could make your one call <laughs> i would call him kim crumbo yeah i mean he was a trained navy seal he did two combat tours in vietnam he was a park ranger with the national park service for decades i mean this guy did it all and you could it's safe to assume he knows how to handle himself in the wild uh experience in this location i put unknown just because I couldn't find any information about how many times he's like been to that one lake. Been to this one lake, but like we said, he was a park ranger in Olympic National Park, Grand Canyon. I'm sure he has visited other national parks, so he's been in a lot of them. But I just don't know for sure if he's hiked here before. Um, okay. So that is about it for um, the character profile, Kim. And I will jump right into timeline here in a second. Now we're going to hear from our exclusive sponsor of this episode, the Chime In Podcast. When Mike and I aren't listening to our own show, we love to chime in to some of our favorite hosts in the true crime unexplained genre. That's right. We're talking about the Chime In Podcast. 
Graham, Sarah, and Michaela explore topics including the unexplained, true crime, missing persons, and much, much more. Their show has included distinguished guests such as U.S. Marshals, Darren Sharper of the Cooper Vortex, and Chris Williamson of Vanished and Chasing Earhart. But wait, there's more. To make it more fun, each episode has trivia questions to include the audience. Mike and I have been enjoying the Chime In podcast since 2018, and now we want to share it with you. You can download and subscribe to the Chime In podcast wherever you listen to your shows. Find them on Twitter at Chime In Podcast. Also, Instagram at Chime In dot pod and Facebook as Chime In Podcast. That's C H I M E I N Podcast. They're big supporters of Locations Unknown, and we hope that our friends enjoy their show as much as we do. So we're going to jump right into the timeline. It starts on September 12th of 2021. So Kim Crumbo and his brother Mark O'Neill, age 67. Now, uh, there were a lot of news reports that stated this was his half-brother. The National Park Service originally reported that, but then they issued a correction on September 29th of 2021. Uh, so he was his actual brother, not half brother. You should do more research, Mike. Clearly, we need more details. <laughs> yes. Um, so they uh, they both set off on a four night excursion in the Shoshone Lake area of Yellowstone National Park. Now, I was telling Joe before we started, um, we don't know the extent of their excursion in the park. We we know that they had a campsite up around the lake and that they were canoeing or kayaking. They could have been doing other day hiking. We don't know. Based on family statements, it sounded like they both wanted to just have a relaxing getaway to kind of clear their minds. So my guess is they probably weren't doing a ton of like, you know, kick your butt type of hiking like Joe and I have done in the past. They probably sure. set up camp and were doing some just relaxing kayaking. And this is actually his brother, his brother. And this is the same kayak that he would have used on this trip. Okay. So uh, it's a good visualization of what he would have been out on yeah, his brother seems like he's in shape yeah his brother is age 67 um another uh, we didn't get into the character profile of his brother we probably should have his brother similar to his you know kim was a great guy you know all the stuff i read um uh, very athletic um lots of experience in the outdoors so not only did uh kim have experience his brother also you know he wasn't the seal and everything but he spent time with him in yeah. the wild so they both were pretty experienced people now this reminds me a lot of the kayaks that we would use on like the boundary waters trips um, yeah like if before we got the uh the uh lighter weight ones the kevlar ones because those are this looks like it's aluminum yeah old school yeah i mean it, it's seen some days yeah <laughs> but i mean those are way more tough yeah those, those kevlar ones like they're super light for portaging but if you hit rocks enough you'll pop holes in them and stuff these are this is super legit canoe. yeah so uh, we're fast forwarding now to September 19th of 2021 when Kim and uh, Mark, and I should make sure I have uh, Alan O'Neill. I don't, I don't know why um, I would have written that. Um, Joe is just going through some pictures. I believe that's a that, picture. This of is Kim. Kim from 2008. Crump. Yeah. Yeah. Just holding a big stick. Um, yeah. He was in Glen Canyon, which I've actually hiked in. Um, he was doing some kind of con, con, uh, conservation work mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah, really cool guy. They'd be a kind of guy that I'd love to just sit down and talk to for like hours to hear his stories. Uh, yeah. The ones he'd be allowed to tell us. So in this picture, he's the guy in the black shirt. He was actually right. a river guide. This is grand Canyon. Um, and he would take groups down. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I still want to do that. He lives, uh, he lives a life that I wish I could have <clears throat> like just being out in the parks and yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something that, okay. The guy's name is Mark O'Neill, not Alan O'Neill. So I don't know why I put Alan. Uh, sorry about that. You just had Alan on the mind, Alan on the mind, just a, Good a little, catch though. little tangent there. So uh, like I said, it's September 19th, 2021. Uh, Kim and Mark failed to check in with family uh, and they reported missing. So park rangers initially found their deserted truck and sent a crew out to examine uh, the brother's last campsite. Within hours of the missing persons report, uh, searchers found a vacant campsite on the south side of the lake. This spot can only be reached by foot. 
Uh, search and rescue personnel also located a canoe paddle a PFD, which is a personal flotation device, and other personal belongings on the east shore of the lake. Now, this is one the first part of the sad news. So uh, it is now the morning of September 20th, 2021. Search and re rescue crews located the body of Mark O'Neill along the east shore of the lake. Um, and I think Joe can pull up a picture here of the east shore of the lake just to give people. Um, I think and I actually have a picture of in the folder. I should go to the east side. I went to the west side. Yeah. So that would be the east side. And um, oh, wait. No, no, no. It's upside down. Oh. I did that. I went to the go. right side there on accident. Go. That makes more sense. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you could pull up the picture I have in the folder of um, East Shore of Shoshone Lake. There yeah. So go. this is kind of what it would look like. Okay. Um, and from what I gathered, storms can whip up and it gets real rough on this end of the lake when storms are rolling through because oh, yeah, all the, it's like right. You can see it's right here. It's the only open spot on that side. So it's literally right here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would be either there. Picture. Maybe. Oh, yeah, there's no shore there. That's true. So if that's the picture they took, ah, right down Maybe here. Maybe down there, but. No, I, I think it's right here based on how wood, how thin and wooded it is. Yeah. Oh, that's the toad. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> wrong one. So, uh, lick the toad. Yeah, so sadly they did find the Bob Kim's brother, Mark O'Neill, on the east shore of the lake that morning. Uh, so now we fast forward to september 20th 2021 which is tuesday search efforts continued with a 10 crew member with 10 crewers on foot uh and grand teton national park deployed additional personnel and an interagency helicopter to assist with the search um fast forwarding now another day so it's the 22nd park search and rescue personnel continued to look for kim uh at this point they were on you know, they were on foot, they were in, in helicopters, and they had a boat on Shoshone Lake. And Joe, there's a couple of pictures of the actual search helicopter um, that I was able to find. That Those are the only pictures of the search they had. These three SAR ones? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is one, one picture of one of these look at, days. Look at that, like, fog and cloud cover over the lake. That's, yeah. that's a wild photo. So... And then, yeah, there's another picture of the helicopter that was searching, and then a third one. And you can kind of zoom in and just see, like, what it looks like. And um, those are really the only pictures of the search that the Park Service released. Um, so uh, the search continued, uh, you know, for several days. So we finally get a press release from the Park Service on the 24th. Um, so at they, they state, after five days of searching, efforts to locate Kim Crumbo at Shoshone Lake in Yellowstone National Park transitioned from rescue to recovery. During the last five days, crews, crews swept all the trails in the area, searched the entire Shoshone Lake shoreline by boat, and gridded the open water by helicopter. Unfortunately, they did not find Crumbo. Now, this is actually really interesting, and I didn't know they had this division in the National Park Service. Crews from the Submerged Resources Center began using sonar equipment to detect clues in the water. Park crews continued to look for Crumbo on foot, by boat, and by air. So I have a little bit more about the Submerged Resources Center because I had never heard of it and didn't know that existed in the Park Service. Um, so the Submerged Resource Center is a unit within the U.S. Park Service. The unit is based out of Lakewood, Colorado. It's a nationally and internationally recognized leader in uh, operational and scientific diving, as well as the location, documentation, interpretation, and preservation of underwater resources, primarily cultural resources. Projects the SRC have been involved in include work on the USS Arizona, the shipwrecks of uh, Isle Royale National Park, and mapping the shipwrecks of Dry Tortugas National Park. So I was reading about this device that Joe has this up is, on. This is cool. So what they do is they they take a sonar map of the ground and then divers use this device to basically navigate underwater and they're using the sonar map as like their navigation i love that they put the national park sticker on there that's oh, yeah. awesome that's so cool <laughs> so what we're looking at for the listeners is it looks like i would argue an underwater rig that almost looks like a metal detector yeah with a giant screen 
in like a waterproof case around something that looks like it's taking images. And what you're not seeing um, on there's some on the end of that, that there's some like propellers, so they're using oh, so it to okay, so they can like they can move around. They, don't have to, they can swim farther, yeah, without using so much energy. Yeah, so this is really cool, and I only highlight this because Joe Got and I have cool been, carbon fiber everywhere. You've been doing this since 2018, and I had no idea this. Yeah, existed I didn't know this. Park thing. Service. So that's really neat. Yeah, and you can see the national park thing on his his suit. That's, yeah, the <laughs> national park dive suit. I want that. <laughs> Would that be? I would totally wear that. I I want to know like how much this device costs. I'm sure it's expensive. Yeah, but I'll uh, look that up while you're talking. So that that is really you know kind of cool use of technology. Uh, you know, sadly, it did not find any evidence of of Kim. Um. So, but it, it's cool that they have that option in the search toolkit. Um. So, the screen, the one screen is twenty five hundred bucks. That seems cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the that's this piece. Yeah, that's oh man. But uh, I'm sure it's like forty or fifty grand. Yeah, I'm sure it's expensive. So fast forward now to uh, September 29th of 2021, and the National Park Service released a press release that the the autopsy on Mark O'Neill had been completed, and he died from exposure, more specifically hypothermia. So. Um, and he was wearing a life jacket at the time he was, his body was recovered. So, um, the thing is when you're, if you fall into water, that's in the forties, you've got about 20 minutes Yeah, before it's, it's too late. If you're not wearing a dry suit or something. Yeah. And I mean, theoretically someone, this the, experiences, these guys, it would probably, they might've got caught out in a storm and you know, got flipped off and disorientated and disoriented. This guy do it every time. <laughs> uh, I'll just say mixed up. Yeah. So um, that's right. I can't say colloquial. Yeah. Colloquial. <laughs> colloquial. Um, so that was a sad press release from the park service about um, what happened to Mr. O'Neill. Um, but I don't think it's surprising that they determined it was hypothermia with that cold of water. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> fast forward now to October 8th of 2021. This would be the final press release from the Park Service on the search. Park officials scaled back the search and recovery efforts due to deteriorating conditions, including snow and freezing rain. Uh, the park planned to continue with a limited search as long as conditions allowed. In all, the search lasted for nearly three weeks using helicopters, boats, sonar technology, and ground crews, but failed to locate a crumbo or any clues about what happened to him. Uh, here's some statements from the Park Service. All of us at Yellowstone extend our deepest sympathies to the families, friends, and colleagues of both Mark and Kim, Superintendent Cam Shally said in a news release that day. I want to personally thank the teams from Yellowstone, other parks, and agencies, and partner organizations who worked to help us locate Mark and who continued to search efforts to bring him home. Authorities continue to investigate what happened uh, to the two brothers. Unofficial searches are also ongoing, Crumbo's wife said, as volunteers continue to walk the perimeter of Shoshone Lake. The timing of this accident is unspeakably sad, but I take some comfort in knowing that they left us doing what they loved, Daniel Crumbo said, and that they had each other in what would be their last of many shared struggles. Both are dearly loved and missed, and deservedly so. So it's a real sad story. I imagine this disappearance and loss of life of Mark probably really hit the park service hard just because Kim was such a, a longtime employee of the park service and his work to preserve and protect the park lands and the animals within it. Um, a real loss to the absolute conservation movement. Um, and I think I can't imagine uh, there's a picture of Mark and Kim together a couple of years before the accident mm -hmm. or the disappearance. Um, he just seems like a fun guy. Yeah. And I mean, what an incredible life uh, full of Doesn't stories he, and things like uh, Kim reminds me of a lot of like the park rangers you come across. Oh, absolutely. Just yes. super fun and happy and just excited to just be out on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> and I can just picture running into a guy like that in any of the parks we've hiked. Oh, 
I love talking to those yeah. guys. They have so many stories and so many stories. A wealth they of They have so many stories and they haven't had half the life experience that he has had. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. so like, uh, that's, that's, ter that's terrible. Yeah. So we'll jump right into theories here. There's, um, not a lot in way of official theories. There was not a lot of speculation from law enforcement. So we'll, Joe and I'll go into what we think will happen, but I'm just going to read some statements from the wives of the two gentlemen that went missing. So wife of Kim, um, she believes a microburst hit the lake that September day, creating treacherous weather conditions that would have tested the limits of any legends, let alone two men with aging bodies. Uh, so, and she goes on to say, since her husband's disappearance, Becky Crumbo has gotten several messages and phone calls from people who knew him while convinced that something sinister happened to him, she said. Um, but, you know, she goes on to say that she doesn't think it was something, you know, like wrong place, wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, I can totally see a weather-related incident causing this. Um, the wife of Mark has a little bit different take on what she thinks happened. Happen. So Karen Lowry, who's the wife of Mark O'Neill, said in a, a newspaper statement, she uh, wrote, we're just, we're just reeling at this, she said, expressing what her family is going through. She's heard a lot of different theories about the accident, but her gut feeling is that the brothers were caught in something very ugly or caught off guard. She said she knows her husband would have never left his brother under any but the most dire circumstances. I feel they were trying to help each other, she said. So I think she is not ruling out um, a weather-related incident, but she, I think, and in a couple other statements, it kind of sounded like she was hinting it. Maybe there was something more to this than just a weather accident. Okay. Um, but so what do you think happened? So we know what happened to Mark. Yeah, I think the same thing happened to both, and unfortunately, they didn't find him. So yeah. I look at it as if, if they got hit with big winds, and they said that that lake experiences big wind gusts, which can make big waves. And in yeah. a canoe or kayak, based on the image we saw, with it was packed with stuff, and we've been in boundary waters. Yeah, You can rock a lot. So if you have big enough waves, you're going to capsize. In water that's that cold, Yeah, if they're not dressed appropriately, they might not. And at their age. Even you get sprayed. Yeah. With that cold water. Yeah. If so, like, that's actually a great point. What if they're already kind of cold? Yeah. And then you add that in. Yep. Um, they're that old. He's had, um, shoulder replacement, things like that. So that you're going to start seizing up. Yeah. Uh, even if you're healthy, you're going to start slowing down, seizing up. So I think of what happens to a canoe or a kayak in high winds. If you're not in it, Yeah. it goes away fast. <laughs> yeah. You cannot swim after it. I've, yeah. I've, you know, I've seen it happen. Like, so if they're in that cold water out in the middle of the lake, out in the middle of the lake, it could have been a thing where they capsize and the canoe gets away from them. So they have to swim to shore. If they're far enough ashore, they may not have had enough time. Yeah. That's, I think this, this, the simplest explanation that makes the absolute most sense is, and we have proof that it happened to at least one of them. Yeah. So unfortunately I think they just did not recover his body. Yeah. I, you know, a lake of that size, they probably obviously weren't able to, sonar the entire bottom with limited resources i mean if you brought in like the u.s navy they and, and he's in he's in the bottom of the lake and they, again we don't want to sound morbid this no. is just going over what most likely if you sonar the whole lake and he's down there and there's like a rock or something too maybe it doesn't even look like yeah. a body so how are they going to see it's a, like you said it's a huge lake they yeah. can't in order to see it they'd probably have to dive down over yeah. the whole thing and that's it's just not gonna it, happen it's not they don't have the resources to do that i i i agree with, with you joe i think uh i think they probably got, both got caught in some wicked weather and um it could have just been wind could have been just wind it, it didn't even have to be like a storm it could have been gust of wind that cap, yeah. like made waves big enough to capsize them and the the lake does drain out a river so theoretically because you wonder like all right well what happened to his gear Mm -hmm. Like some of his gear might have sunk, you know, sunk, sure. but the, the kayak isn't going to sink, but that could have, maybe it floated out of the lake down the river and, you know, maybe someone found it and just like, Oh, free kayak or who knows what happened to it. But, yeah. um, yeah, I think sadly, um, they, you know, the same thing happened to Mark. Um, and that's the thing you can be the most experienced 
person out in the wilderness and just get caught in the wrong situation at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I remember being in the boundary waters with some, you know, strong winds and you you got to paddle into the wind to keep the, the waves from tipping you over. And it's exhausting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely exhausting for someone. I was in my late twenties doing it and I was, I was <laughs> dying. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, getting stuck, you know, imagine a microburst. Yeah. 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. I mean, yeah, that would capsize you in, yeah. very easily, especially yeah. if you have gear loaded in there. Yeah. So I think, uh, I think sadly this one is pretty cut and dry. I, I thought it was important to cover this case just because, like I said in the beginning, that we're getting close to Veterans Day. And uh, Kim was a very distinguished uh, U.S. military veteran that served in Vietnam. So I think uh, important case to cover because I had never, I never even heard about this in the news. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, and I forgot to mention, uh, we had a, this was recommended by a listener. Um, probably should have done that in the beginning, but if she's still listening all the way to the end, thank you. To, yeah, she's, um, she's, she's in the middle of writing a bad review right yeah, now. Thank you to Angie Helmick, uh, Walter for recommending this to us in June of 2022. So yeah, don't write the bad review now. We, <laughs> we, we, we did what we said we were going to yeah, do. Yeah. We apologize. Um, but Joe, I don't know. You have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think that is it. Uh, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate you all for listening and sharing locations and then with your friends and family, be sure to like, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, uh, and YouTube. I always forget to say YouTube where you can YouTube. find the videos of each episode. So if you want to see the pictures that we're talking about, uh, you can go ahead on there. I'm, I'm raising the volume of the wrong thing. That's what's throwing me off. Also, <laughs> if you would like to support the show monetarily outside of the subscriptions, please visit our website or Facebook store to buy some cool swag. Additionally, as I said, you can subscribe to our patron account, uh, YouTube, and now on Apple subscriptions. And in order to find our podcast on Apple subscriptions, you just search for our name again. Even if you're subscribed to our show, search for locations unknown, and you'll see a separate show listed where you'll have access to all of our additional episodes that you'd love to uh, come listen to. We're at like, what, like 30? Uh, 28, 28, almost 30. Um, so you'll have access to those and potentially special events, uh, for paid customers only. Lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks. And we will see you all next time.